Hi, this is Dr. Diane Gayhart, and this is my lecture on case conceptualization based on Chapter 2 in my book, Mastering Competencies in Family Therapy. And so in this lecture, I'm going to walk you through how to put together a case conceptualization. And I'm going to be straightforward with you from the beginning that case conceptualizations take time, and they take work, and they take thought, and so one might say they are a bit on the tough side. Um, and in all honesty, it will probably take you 10 to 20 hours to put together your first case conceptualization. And I know that sounds like a lot of time, um, but you will also find, and I really believe, that this is the most clinically useful form you'll probably ever fill out. And because what it's going to do is kind of walk you through the key conceptual and assessment areas from each of the major theories covered in this book. So that means it's going to kind of walk you through all the key assessment ways of conceptualizing, working with individuals, couples, and families from all the major theories in the field of family therapy. So it does sound like a, a, a bit of work and a bit of an intellectual exercise, and it is, but I will say it's, it's one of the most useful things you can do because it is going to allow you to really think through your cases in a much more um, holistic, complete, and theoretically comprehensive way. And I will tell you, when I get stuck in my own clinical practice, what I do is basically do a case conceptualization, kind of like what is described in this chapter, myself, on my clients to help me get unstuck. So I think it's a tool that you will find useful for many, many years down the road. Whenever you're kind of clinically stuck and wondering, wow, why isn't therapy you know, proceeding as I thought it might, you step back, you reassess using your case conceptualization, and usually you will find some area where maybe you didn't assess enough or didn't pick up on a certain dynamic, and you will find this very, very useful. So, you have been duly and fairly warned that work is involved, but I think you've also been fairly warned that the rewards are pretty, pretty high, and it's definitely worth the effort. So, case conceptualizations really are going to help you focus on where to focus your attention while you're listening to clients talk. It's also going to help you know what questions to ask in the beginning when you're assessing, and it's going to help you view the situation in a new way. Because therapists, what's really different between us and anyone else when we're trying to help people with their problems is that we're able to look at things a little bit differently. And it's that difference in viewing, and once you're able to identify what's going on um, using a case conceptualization, using the theories that we have to understand what's going on in people's lives, what to do and how to intervene, it all is very, it all becomes very simple. Once you have a good case conceptualization, you'll know exactly what to do um, in session, and the interventions and all that stuff will make sense. But until you have your handle on, on what's actually going on, it gets very, can, it can be difficult to know what, what to focus on and what not to focus on. And so this particular uh, case conceptualization is based around marriage and family therapy theory. So it's a theory informed um, assessment. In chapter three, we go over clinical assessment, which uses the DSM diagnosis categories to kind of look at what's going on with the clients. But this case conceptualization is really the most practically useful for any mental health clinician because it's giving you the, the level of kind of depth and understanding what's going on and the level of detail that you need to think about where mental health diagnosis, it is helpful, but it's not enough for mental, for someone who's doing psychotherapy or family therapy to know exactly what to do in session. A mental health diagnosis is really great for psychiatrists who are making, you know, prescribing medications. They're kind of done when they've got their, uh, you know, mental health diagnosis. But for anyone who's doing family therapy, psychotherapy, working with individuals, couples, using talk therapy, as some people might call it, um, we need something a lot more detailed and in-depth to understand the subtle dynamics that are going on, and that's what a case conceptualization will give. So, in the the case conceptualization that is covered in this book has five general elements. The first is introducing the client, and that's kind of where you basically define the, the demographics of the client. Then the second part, you go over the presenting concern, and we look at it not just from the person who may have the problem, but from what everyone in the 
family system is saying or significant others are saying, and then also what the people in the broader social system, so that'd be school counselors or teachers or doctors or even extended family members are saying about the problem. And then section three, we go into background information, and that's a summary of pertinent background information, both recent things that might be going on, kind of the brief history of well, because it may be brief, sometimes it's not so brief, but what's been going on when the problem developed, and then broader long-term um, issues, such as a childhood trauma or such, um, that might also be affecting what's going on. It's always good to know as a therapist starting out. The fourth section, systemic assess assessment, is really the bulk of the case conceptualization, and this is where things start to get tough. But this is where we're going to go through and conceptualize what's going on using er the major family therapy theories to understand the interpersonal dynamics. And then finally we have the section on the genogram, which is an assessment tool that comes out of intergenerational Bowenian family therapy, but is very useful no matter what approach you uh, work from and this is another tool for understanding uh, family dynamics. So these are the five sections of the case conceptualization covered in this book. So here you can see the first section of the case conceptualization form itself. There's a place for the therapist's name, the case or client number, the date. And here's that first section we just mentioned where you're going to go over basically the age and ethnicity, um, occupation and grade for the AF is adult female, AM is adult male. CF is child female, CM is child male. And as you can see, there are little extra lines there if your family is configured a bit differently. So, um, for this first section, you're providing a basic sketch of the client for anyone reading this assessment. And this is where you're going to go over the common demographics, including the age of each person, the ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and their current occupation. Sometimes you you might even put where they're working and or their grade in school. And so you here you're just going to give the basic information so people have a general sense of who we're dealing with. And you will also put an asterisk next to the each person who will be in session. And if there is an IP, someone who's identified as the identified patient, you can put an IP next to that name, like if a child, a family is coming in to work on a quote unquote child's issue. Initially, you will put an IP next to the name of, or, or next to the initials of the um, person who has been identified as the identified patient. In this second section, we're going to start describing the presenting concern. And oftentimes, um, there will be one line to describe the presenting concern, but I think when you're working with a family, even if you're working with an individual, it's very important to think about how the, fam the problem is defined by various people who are talking about the um, problem. In collaborative therapy that's uh, covered, I believe it's chapter 15 of your book, um, we, there's, um, they talk about a problem organizing system. And what that means is that therapy system organizes itself around somebody defining a problem. And what's interesting is that when you start going around and asking people what they think the problem is, often you can end up with very different definitions or ideas about what the problem really is. For example, you might have a teacher who refers a student um, or calls up the parent and says that, you know, I think your child has ADHD, you need to take them to see a therapist. And so the teacher has this one definition. The mother um, might agree with this definition of the, you know, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. However, the, the husband might be saying, I don't think it's that at all. I, I think it's that we're not strict enough with, with him, and that's the problem. And you might have another sibling there who's saying, oh, no, no, they just baby, you know, my little brother, and that's really the problem. And you might have a school counselor who might say, well, this kid is a bully at school, and that's actually more the problem. And so there are lots of different people who have different ideas about what might be going on. Um, including you know, grandparents who might be saying, well, I think there's really, you know, the parents fight too much, and that's really what the problem is. And it can be very helpful for the therapist to actually sit back and reflect on how each person is defining the problem differently. Because as you move through therapy and you hit various uh, bumps or twists in the road or twists in the story, um, having these alternative descriptions of what might be going on can help give you clues as to where you might need to focus and what else might be going on to help explain some of the things that, you know, lack of progress or such. So it can be very useful to have these different descriptions of the problem. 
So again, just to kind of go over some of this idea of the presenting concern, the other piece that's also important is taking the time if you, I know it's often, you don't want to pick up the phone and make that phone call, get the little signed release to make the call, but it can be very helpful to also talk to people who referred the person or the family to counseling, like a, a school teacher or a psychiatrist, um, but it can be very helpful to get the referring parties perspective on what needs to be addressed in session. In this background section, you're going to divide the background into two parts, the recent background and then the related historical background. And here you'll just write out in kind of narrative format a description of the key clinical issues that you want to highlight in these areas. So in terms of the first section here, you're going to highlight relevant recent backgrounds in terms of any recent life changes and this can be a move, a divorce, um, it can be positive things, even a marriage or a new job or promotion. So you want to think of both positive and negative changes because both can create stress and create changes in a, significant changes in a family system. You want to look for any precipitating events. Do they attribute their symptoms to a particular uh, situation or event? Um, any, when were the first symptoms and what were they and when did they start? And any other type of stressors that are helpful in understanding the immediate presenting problem that they're coming with. Then in the second section, you want to highlight related historical background, such as the family history, any related issues, past incidents of abuse, whether as a child or an adult, past incidents of trauma, any previous counseling, any significant medical or mental health history, all of these things can be very helpful um, to just have in, the, have in your mind and know about as you're beginning treatment. So now we're going to get into the systemic assessment itself and we're going to begin by assessing client and relational strengths. And you can see here that there's a section to highlight personal and individual strengths, relational and social strengths, and spiritual strengths. Now when most people think about assessing strengths, they think it's going to be a lot easier than assessing pathology and problems. But I have found it is generally a lot more difficult and requires a lot more, um, let's say, crafty thinking on the part of the therapist. Because cl most clients come in and they're ready to talk about problems because they're coming to you for help with those. So they've often thought about all of that and oftentimes by the time they finally get to a therapist, they feel so overwhelmed by the problem that's all they can think about is the problem and our problems and so their whole lens for looking at what's going on is just really about focusing on what the problem is and so when you start to assess or ask about what might be going well when the problem is less of a problem those types of things they sometimes have, have, have difficulty actually reconnecting um, with some of their strengths and resources or have difficulty seeing the strengths and resources in others. And so it often takes um, some special efforts on the part of the therapist to, to really do a meaningful job of assessing strengths. So how might you assess for strengths? The first is, as it, you know, start with the obvious, which is to ask directly. Um, and sometimes this is quite successful depending on the, per, you know, the client and the situation and all that good stuff, but to ask you know, um, you know what things have worked with the problem. You know, oftentimes maybe with a couple, you know, that you can ask. You know, when were things better in their relationship, and they can quickly come up with a response. Um, so asking directly is always worth a try. The other way to do it, and if that isn't working so good for you, um, you want to start listening for exceptions or times when the problem is less of a problem, context where the problem is less of a problem, people um, and relationships in which the problem is less of a problem. And so just noticing these exceptions, noticing when things are less of a problem and asking um, when it's less of a problem rather than asking well, when is a problem not a problem, when doesn't this happen. Oftentimes they, sometimes they get to the point where they think, well, it's always there, you know, he's always like this, she's always like this, I'm always depressed, whatever it might be. So so when it's less of a problem, um, and sometimes you need to ask several follow-up questions um, to help them remember those times. And then another interesting way to kind of work on uh, identifying strengths, so always think of that the flip side of the problem behavior almost always has 
is a strength in another context. So, for example, if, if a client worries a lot, people who worry, okay, they often are very good at paying attention to details and very thoughtful at planning and, and very good at those sorts of things, um, which can be a strength in another context. For, for, you know, for example, if you're planning a trip to you know, Europe, you want someone who has propensity for worrying to plan that trip because you know, they will think about how is your train connection going to meet up with your plane connection? That's going to, and how far is that going to really be to your hotel? What time of day or night are you going to be arriving? And how are you going to get from the train station to the hotel? You want someone who worries to be planning that trip because if you have someone who doesn't think about that level of detail and planning, you might just find yourself stranded in the middle of you know Paris um, in a dark stormy night without an umbrella. So, so you want to. Think of those things and notice where worrying in one, you know, might be the problem, but where that attention to detail and planfulness is working for them in another context. And I, you know, and sometimes it even helps to point some of that out. Um, you know, depression very similar. You know, research actually shows, and this is depressing, um, but research does show that people who are depressed tend to actually have more realistic expect, uh, assessments of their actual abilities and that people who are quote-unquote well-adjusted actually are less realistic in their assessments of their abilities. Um, but anyway, so that's, that is a potential strength of depression. You know, oftentimes people are depressed because, you know, a dream has somehow been shattered. You know, they broke up with someone or they didn't get the job they were hoping for. And so the flip side of that is that this is someone who has pursued their dreams. They have dreams and they have tried to pursue them. And yes, they had this bump in the road and things didn't, or, and or things didn't come out the way they planned. But you know, you can, there are also people who have this strength of pursuing dreams because you will have people and meet people, especially in your practice, who don't pursue anything, who have a hard time coming up with anything to even hope for. So people who are depressed tend to be psychologically minded. They tend to be reflective and think about life. And, and um, so there are different strengths that actually are usually the flip side of whatever the problem is. And if you can find ways to take those abilities, skills, propensities, and use them to the client's advantage in another context, and even better to use them to help solve the problem, that is where assessing strengths can be very, very useful. So just as you're talking, it does take a special mindset, and I highly recommend that you watch videos of solution-focused and narrative therapists who are particularly good at finding strengths when people are describing situations that often sound hopeless. And that's a very important skill to develop as a therapist because it can really make addressing issues that clients come in with much easier. What are the specific strengths that you will be assessing? So the first area to look at are personal or individual strengths. So these are specific abilities and personal qualities of the people who would be attending your session. Then next you want to look at the relational and social strengths that this person or these, this family might have. So are there people that they, you know, is there someone they can pick up the phone and call when they're having a bad day? Is there someone who helps them pick up the kids after school? Um, is there someone who helps provide financial support? Is there a community where the person feels understood or at least a part of? A religious community, a social group. So getting a sense of, you know, what their social and relational world looks like it can be very, very helpful. Is there one person that they can go and, you know, talk to about what's going on? Those are real important strengths that therapists can use um, in numerous ways to help support treatment. And then finally, to ask and think about spiritual resources. You know, how does this client view their relationship to life, God, or that whatever they conceptualize as being larger than themselves? How do they think life works? How do they think God works? How does how does that all come together? Because the spiritual resources can be very valuable when dealing with life difficulties. And you know, even the simple belief that things happen for a reason or that God is benevolent. Those types of beliefs can really help people weather some rough times in their lives. And so as a therapist, you can help people reconnect with these beliefs um, and, and help find ways to use those to help clients learn how to more skillfully and effectively deal with whatever they've brought, um, whatever concerns they've brought to therapy. So in this next section is where we really get into the systemic assessment part. We're going to start by assessing the couple subsystem. And you can assess either the current relationship, 
the past relationship or their parents' relationship. So if they're an adult who's had some intimate um, relationships, then you would do either the current or the most recent past relationship or most significant past relationship that you think you're going to be working on. And then, and or if they're kids or haven't had significant relationships, you can uh, assess the parents' relationship. And when, when working with kids, it's very important to actually take some time to assess the couple, their parents' function, functioning, because that often affects the child's um, emotional and mental and social well-being. So as you can see here, we're going to look at the boundaries of the couple. We're going to look at their interaction pattern. We're going to look at complementary behaviors, their communication stances, and finally the indicators of divorce. When assessing the couple subsystem, the first place we're going to start is assessing their boundaries. And boundaries is a concept that comes from structural therapy and it's very helpful as kind of a starting point for just getting a sense of what's going on in the couple relationship. So the first thing, now what boundaries are in the biggest general sense, they are rules for negotiating closeness and distance. And each family system, each couple system, comes up with its unique ways of negotiating closeness and distance. And these rules are often very much affected by culture and gender. And so even though we're going to come up with some generic categorizations for types of boundaries, that even, you know, for example, if you assess a family as having enmeshed boundaries, every family has a unique set of rules for how they do enmeshment and or how they do rigidness and even how they do clear boundaries. And so you've got to remember that, that that's why there's a, um, a section where you can describe some of the unique characterizations of how they negotiate boundaries and what this, the unique rules they have for relating. But in general, there are three very broad categories that boundaries fall into. The first are clear boundaries. And there's a wide range of clear boundaries and you, you know, these are again very much affected by culture and gender norms. But in clear boundaries, people are able to negotiate closeness, they feel close to each other, and independence, they also feel like they have um, enough freedom in the relationship. And they're able to negotiate this generally to everyone's satisfaction most of the time and without any symptoms developing either within an individual or within the system. So, so the definition of when, is, when are boundaries clear, when are they healthy, it really comes down to are there symptoms that are being created from the dynamics in the relationship. And if there are, then they are not clear. So then there are two types um, of what we broad types of problematic boundaries. One is relationships in where independence and freedom are valued more over interdependence. And so in these um, situations, there's too much distance between people. They aren't relying on each other enough. They're not working closely together enough. There isn't enough emotional intimacy. And symptoms develop because of that. On the other end of the spectrum, we have enmeshed boundaries. And that is when there's too much interdependence. There is too much, exp there, generally you will see expectations that, you know, the other person should feel and think the same way I do. And if they don't, that's a personal affront to me. And so there's a lot of pressure to be conforming in enmeshed relationships to the point where people are experiencing some kind of symptoms. And again, this is very much culturally determined in terms of where that line, where it goes from being a clear healthy boundary to where it becomes a more problematic boundary. The next area of assessment is the interactional pattern between the couple. And this is probably the hallmark assessment for marriage and family therapists. And you will see this particular assessment of interaction patterns is a hallmark of the MRI systemic approach, the Milan systemic approach, strategic therapy, the satir growth model, symbolic experiential, emotionally fam focused family therapy. And so you will see this in many of the theoret theories in this book. And what is happening here is that you're looking at how the behavior of A affects the behavior of B which then affects the response again of person A, which again affects the response of person B. And so that you're always looking at any particular quote-unquote problem behavior within this recursive interaction, interactional sequence. And so it's very much the heart of family therapy. So how do you actually go about assessing for um, this interactional pattern? 
it's a little bit, it is, it does get to be a little bit tricky. The first thing you want to do is start with a behavioral description of how the problem starts. And so if a family's coming in and saying their son has tantrums, you would say, so tell me, give me a description of what happens at the beginning of one of these tantrums. And so this would be considered the beginning of the positive feedback loop if you want to get into some systemic language. And so, of course, most likely the mother will start by saying, well, this, you know, the son is having a tantrum. And so then you would ask, well, how does she responding to it? How does the mother respond? How does the father respond? And then how does the child respond to their response? And so you would keep going on um, and asking about how people are interacting in this sequence. If it's a couple arguing, you would ask, you know, so if the wife comes in, you know, I mean, if the husband comes home and the wife starts saying, you know, why haven't you da 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 da? And so then you would have, you know, ask about, well, how does he respond to, you know, her kind of what he's describing as maybe a critique of her? And then, you know, what does he say back? And what does he do? And then how does she respond to that? You know, and then maybe he leaves the room. And so what do you do when your husband leaves the room? So you would keep tracking this sequence and you keep asking, and then what happens? And then what do you do? And then what does he do? And then what do you do? And then what does he do? Until things get back to normal. And so oftentimes you're asking, you know, oftentimes, for example, with the couple, they maybe, you know, go to bed angry and they wake up in the morning, everything is fine. And, you know, then you're like, so when you wake up in the morning, things are back to normal, you guys kind of get back on track. And that's getting back to what we call homeostasis. And so when you're assessing the interactional problem sequences, it's very important to start with the, how the behaviorally arises, try to get as many behavioral descriptions rather than interpretations of other people's, you know, behavior like, you know, he gets snarky with me or, um, and try to come up with a agree, some kind of behavioral term that the two can agree upon and keep tracking and tracking and tracking this until things feel normal again, until they're kind of back in sync again. And so it's also important when you're assessing the couple to also um, ask about how kids are responding, how friends are responding. If they're picking up the phone and calling, you know, their sister or their mother or their best friend, um, how is that other person responding and what does their response, how does that affect the interactional cycle? It's very important to ask about those other people also. So this is how you assess the interactional pattern and then you will just document this in summary, of course, um, in the systemic assessment section. Now in this next section, you're going to assess the complementary patterns in a relationship. And this is um, used frequently in the MRI systemic approach, the Milan systemic, strategic therapy, structural therapy, and symbolic experiential therapies. Complementary patterns are fairly normal within a relationship. Um, it's when they get exaggerated and rigid that they really become problematic. So a very common dynamic, complementary dynamic in a relationship in a, in a couple relationship is a pursuer distancer where one person is pursuing and the other person is distancing. And this kind of keeps the amount of emotional intimacy stable in the relationship. And in most relationships, this kind of flips back and forth and it's not too exaggerated and it's just part of the natural kind of ebb and flow of the relationship. But when this becomes chronic and rigid, where one person's always pursuing, the other person's always distancing, and it becomes a source of conflict, then you have a more problematic complementary pattern. We also see this problematic pattern develop over overfunctioners and underfunctioners. So one person overfunctions doing, you know, all the finances and the cleaning and organizing and, you know, primary breadwinner, primary child caretaker, and the other person starts underfunctioning, functioning less and less and less. And it begins to look like these characteristics are in the individuals where they're actually part of the systemic dynamic. Because if you took, for example, the underfunctioner and put this person in another context, in another relationship, they might easily become the overfunctioner in that other context or other relationship. And so you and that's where being having that systemic lens is very helpful in understanding that a lot of things that sometimes look like individual personality characteristics are actually part of the system. We see this too with the logical and the emotional partners. 
Um, oftentimes, the stereotype is typically the woman becomes the emotional one, and the man is the logical one, and we begin to believe that the man is no longer capable of a you know emotion, and the woman is not capable, you know, of being logical. And even the parties within the system begin to describe themselves and believe this about themselves. Where again, if you put them in a different context, a different situation outside this relationship, or in a different t or in a different couple partnership, they could have very different behaviors. Similarly, um, the good parent, bad parent, uh, as you can imagine, is a very uh, common yet uh, problematic complementary pattern that we want to be aware of and intervene upon. And it's one of the things that we can identify early here in this couple assessment. Now in this next section, you are going to assess the satire communication stances um, for the couple. And this is one of those probably less popular, less, you know, used in recent times, but I actually, I highlighted in this uh, systemic assessment because I really believe it's useful for helping, especially new therapists, conceptualize how to actually speak to your own client, not just, you know, what's going on in the relationship, but also to help you figure out more successful ways of communicating with your client. So we're going to walk you through this real briefly. So there is one communication style called being congruent, that is considered the healthy communication stance. The other four stances are what Satir called survival stances, and these are stances that we learn to adopt um, as children and growing up whenever we felt that um, that we were in a difficult, tense situation or being attacked or defending ourselves. And so these are, these are communication strategies that we learned while younger whenever we felt vulnerable or in a difficult situation. So in, when you're being congruent in the ideal way of communicating, um, and the way that many people will naturally communicate when they don't feel threatened, when they don't feel vulnerable, is you're able to honor and recognize your own thoughts, needs, and wants the thought needs and as well as the thoughts needs and wants of the other person as well as um, communicating in a way that's appropriate for the context in the relationship and no major component of communication is ignored in this more healthy way of communicating and of course all this is on the spectrum and people can move back and forth between stances so the first communication stance and this is typically what will happen if one is feeling threatened or one is feeling that there's stress in a relationship a person might shift back into a placating stance and in placating the person focuses on meeting the needs of the other being appropriate for the context but they minimize and often do not adequately recognize their own needs wants and desires so these are people pleasers. These are people who tend to like to have peace everywhere and to feel comfortable inside. And so because of that, they will give up some of their own, you know, important needs and wants in order to keep keep the peace. What happens over the long term with placating, although being in a relationship with a placator is usually very enjoyable because they will take care of your needs. That's nice. But after a while, they do get resentful, tired, and burned out. And that's where it becomes more of a problem. So it's more of a problem down the road. Um, and oftentimes they can tend towards being depressed because their needs and wants, desires and hopes are not being addressed. In terms of the blamer, this is kind of the opposite stance. So you'll see a lot of people where a placator is married to a blamer and they're just a perfect little fit. They work well. So the blamer is good at recognizing their own needs and wants and asserting their own needs and wants and being appropriate for the context. But um, they do so at the expense of taking into consideration the needs and wants and desires of the other person. And so in this situation, the person can, you know, either be assertive or aggressive in terms of, you know, articulating their needs, but they are not taking into account sufficiently the needs of the other to have a balanced relationship. So you can see where the placator often partners with the blamer because they work well together, at least in the short term. And so that's one thing, understanding that and seeing that, um, kind of complementary pattern here again, you as a therapist can help the couple begin to kind of balance out and learn how to, you know, speak with each other. And generally, as you um, create a safer environment in which to communicate, they will be less likely to even use their placating and blaming stances. But you can also use this way of conceptualizing to help them understand each other and what's going on in the relationship. The third type of communication stance is the super reasonable type. And this 
type focuses only on context. And so they're focusing on what's logical generally or some kind of external rule for um and they they you know focus on what is logical or some kind of other external set of rules in order to create order in their relationship. So I often think of Dr. Spock for being a super reasonable type. Often lawyers pretend to fall into this type too. Um, and they actually minimize the needs and personal subjective worlds of both the self and both themselves and the other person and instead appeal to this external thing. What is logical in this situation? That's all I want to worry about. I don't want to get this mucked up with everyone's emotions. Um, and finally, the irrelevant type it does not recognize self, other, or context. Um, and they, these are the type who, whenever you try to bring up a sensitive, difficult topic to talk about, they change the subject or they make a joke and they somehow are like bouncing around the room like a super ball. And so, um, with the irrelevant type, it's, it's more challenging as a therapist to even kind of get them to talk about difficult situations unless you can make the context feel safer, in which case the safer they feel, the less vulnerable they're feeling, um, the less they will need to use this. So it's helpful as a therapist to think of these communication patterns in terms of how we as therapists are communicating with our clients. For example, a placator will placate not just their partner, but their therapist, of course, um, in addition. So you need to, with these clients, be very careful about divulging too much personal information, letting, giving any sense of what you think they should be doing at all. I use, I only recommend open-ended or multiple choice questions, you know, and you know, I would never even make, you know, maybe over the next week you might want to try to do X is, is already, they will say yes, even if in their mind they're going, there's no way in the world I'll ever do that. So with placators, you need to be, create lots of space for their voice to be heard and to make it very clear that, you know, and to make sure that they are um, exercising their true voice and opinion. I, I don't feel like I have good rapport with a placator until they actually disagree with me and say, no, therapist, that really wasn't a good idea. Do you got something better for me? Um, and so, or no, I think you're wrong on that point. That's when I know I have good rapport with a placator. Now, on the other hand, with the blamer, blamers can be the first one to say, you know, I think you're wrong, and no, that's a bad idea, I'll never do that. They don't have any trouble with that. And oftentimes, blamers actually like therapists who are more direct, who don't kind of soften their responses. Well, you may want to think about, they might see that as, as being wishy-washy. Um, and so there's a different communication stance you use with blamers that are often more direct. Um, I remember with certain with certain people who kind of would fall into this blaming category, I often feel like, for me, I'm hitting them with a two-by-four, but that's kind of how they feel respected when I'm direct and concrete and real with them, because then they feel like they're dealing with someone who is is not placating them, and so there's often a level of respect that comes from that. And with the super reasonable types, it's very important that therapists find a way I mean, you really do need to understand that context with, or whatever set of rule or logic system that they organize their life around. It can be just, you know, kind of a generic type of logic. It can be a religious system. Um, it can be lots of different ways of looking at their lives. But if that's what they're appealing to, it's very important that the therapist understand that and use to you learn that language and understand it so that you communicate in a way where they feel understood and heard. And as I mentioned with the irrelevant um, communication stands, this is one where keeping the keeping things safe and so that you can have conversations about what needs to be talked about um, without them feeling like they need to distract from this tense conversation. Now in this last part of the systemic assessment or the couple interaction the couple assessment, um, you're going to look at the divorce indicators as developed by John Gottman. He's a researcher at the University of Washington who's been studying couple interactions um, for over 30 years and has developed uh, by an analyzing conversations, especially arguments between um, potentially divorcing couples or couples in distress, um, he's identified the key factors that predict divorce. And the most famous and the most uh, the funnest the most fun a name here is the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. And these are the first four um, factors that he identified that can predict divorce. And the first is criticism, which is when you're putting down your partner in, in their entirety. You're not 
complaining about a specific behavior that happened one time, but you are saying you are lazy, you're no good, you're, you know, you're thoughtless, you know. Those types of, those are crit criticisms of the whole person, of some kind of personality characteristic. Defensiveness, um, most of us know defensiveness, but defensiveness is when you're feeling attacked and criticized, um, is a response where you start saying, hey, no, that's not true, and you start defending yourself. Another component he saw was contempt, and this is actually the most um, deadly, shall we say, of the four horsemen, in, in that contempt was not found in couples who ended up staying in stable, happy marriages. Contempt is when one person feels unilaterally better than their partner, and it is often expressed by that kind of contemptuous eye roll, um, but generally there's this pervasive sense that you are superior to your partner, period, end of that sentence. Stonewalling um, is more frequently used by men, but what stonewalling involves shutting out the other person, ending the conversation, either by physically leaving the room or by simply refusing to communicate, refusing to talk, so picking up the newspaper while their spouse is yelling at them. And so these are the four particular um, factors and characteristics of couple communication that Gottman identified in couples who were likely to be divorced within five years. And notice that the expression of anger is not on this list, and that was something, anger, um, for better or worse, was you know, found in couples who were stable and happy, as well as couples who ended up divorced. It was these four items, though. And these, especially criticism, defensiveness, and stonewalling, were also found in stable, happy marriages, but the ratio and the frequency is much higher in couples who are about to divorce. In couples who are about to divorce, you see this one-to-one -one ratio, where it's, you know, criticism, defensiveness, it's pretty much a back-and-forth um, ratio there. The other three elements that... Um, Gottman uses to help predict divorce. One is failed repair attempts. And a repair attempt is when a couple is arguing, or even after the argument, one of the two partners softens and kind of says, you know, hey, I'm sorry, or, you know, maybe you've got a point. But somehow they start softening up, kind of moving towards resolution and winding down this argument. Um, and couples who are he headed for divorce, there are a lot more repair attempts because so many of them are fail. And what that means is one person says, hey, I'm sorry, and the other person comes right back at them with another criticism or defensive, defensive posture. Well, you know, yeah, you're right. You, you really do need to work on blah, 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 blah. So that type of response is indicative of a couple who is headed for divorce without treatment. Um, another criteria here is rejection of influence, and this is actually what Gottman found was that men who reject the influence of their wives, so this is a very gendered uh, finding here, there's a much higher likelihood of divorce in that particular type of couple. So when the, the wife is making suggestions or making requests and the husband does not accept that influence, um, that type of couple has a high likelihood of ending up divorce. And the last element is a harsh startup. And this actually, women were more uh, likely to begin raising an argument with a harsh startup. So a harsh startup is rather than raising a, a topic kind of gently, you know, honey, the next time you, you know, um, you know, come home late, you know, if you don't mind, give me a call. Uh, that's a soft startup. Uh, where a harsh startup is, oh my God, I cannot believe you failed to call me one, once yet again. You never think of blah, 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 blah. So that's a harsh startup. So, so that type of startup, especially on the part of women, was characteristic of couples who ended up divorced within five years of the study. So those are some of the divorce indicators, and these are, of course, very helpful to consider when you're assessing couples.